Hi there, and welcome to the final video of 27201 Sedimentary Rocks and Fossils from me. Um, in which we're going to be looking at how we can use trace fossils to understand a bit about the environment of the deposition of a rock. And in particular, we'll be thinking about water depth once more, because like we have biofacies of um, animals, we also have ichnofacies of trace fossils. But more on that in just a second. So we'll continue um, thinking about this in terms of a general marine environment of a clastic shelf. Lots of the rocks we're interested in come from that environment. Uh, and the body fossils that we've looked at throughout these videos um, rarely give us information about the behavior of organisms. There are elements of them that do. We can use functional morphology, i.e. the shape of the, their morphology, to try and understand the function of their different bits. but those insights are relatively few and far between. In contrast, trace fossils, such as those pictured on this slide, are very important because they record that behavior, the behavior of organisms directly. And that behavior is often controlled by the environment in which an organism lives, right? So your, uh, for an obvious example, is that within a, a, an ocean or within water, um, buoyancy is radically different to the buoyancy of an animal in air, and that will impact on their behavior and the traces that they make. As such, uh, extensive work has been um, uh, done using trace fossils, especially burrows, to try and determine water depth. Some traces on the odd occasion can be relatively easily associated with the trace maker, the animal that made those traces, because sometimes in, in unusual in examples, such as this fantastic Xyphosurin or horseshoe crab from the uh, Jurassic, I think, of Germany. Yep, Jurassic there. Um, you find uh, the dead animal at the end of the trail, right? And that allows you to say that trail was made by that animal. Of course, you then have to consider whether that animal was behaving strangely because it was about to die, but that's a whole thing. Um, so let's not get into that. But in many cases, um, that is not true. There are many trace fossils, and examples are shown on the left here, where we don't know precisely the trace maker, and indeed there could be several trace makers. And what we're recording here is a particular class or kind of behavior. And even when that's the case, when we don't know what the trace maker is, we can recognize patterns in the distribution of these trace fossils. FYI, trace fossils get their own species name based on their shape. Whether that's appropriate or not, I will let you consider. And if you want to ask me about it in Zoom, I can happily give you my opinion. And that is true of both marine and terrestrial, so land-based environments. Um, and there are a whole load of terrestrial uh, trace fossils that I won't be covering over the course of the next few slides because we've only got so much time. They're also more useful for the rocks that we're typically interested in as geologists. So, you know, there's always that. We would, I would also like to point out before we go any further that um, trace fossils are far more limited in carbonate facies because these tend to lithify very, very quickly. We even get the development of things called hard, hard grounds or firm grounds where actually cementation occurs uh, within a very short period of time. And so all of the trace makers won't be leaving traces in those hardened substrates. So just bear that in mind. This is particularly useful on silice clastic shelves. So I want to highlight that we have an onshore to offshore gradient in trace fossils. And this is present from intertidal environments all the way down to the deep sea. And we can organize those into once more, I guess, fairly loose categories, same with our benthic assemblages, which we call ichnofacies. And those are developed on or within soft and unconsolidated sediments. Um, I will add some big caveats to this after introducing some of the major ones. So just be aware that these caveats are coming. Don't forget that they're, they're gonna be uh, highlighted at the end of this. But the four main associations that we have between ichnofacies and depth are Skeletos, Cruziana, Zuvikos, Zuvikos, sorry, and Nereites. So those are the ichnofacies, and I'm gonna go through each of them now. So let's start with Skeletos. Skeletos, uh, you can see some typical examples of the trace fossils that you see in this um, assemblage on the left hand side here and the names of these trace fossils are shown here on my slide. Um, this, this 
ichnophages is generally associated with high energy conditions with moving and well sorted sands. Thus, we associate it normally with shallow water. It is marked or defined by a variety of vertical, single or U-shaped burrows, which are circular in cross-section if they haven't been diagenetically altered. It's usually fairly low in its diversity of trace fossils and is dominated by abundant burrows of suspension feeders. A really famous example of the Sclethos facies is the pipe rock from the um, Cambrian in the northwestern highlands as well as Silurian strata in the west of Ireland and the southern Norway. You can see an example of our pipe rock here, and it's called pipe rock because some of these um, burrows look an awful lot like pipes. So these burrows in the pipe rock are Skeletos burrows themselves, after which this Ignophages is named. So that's really cool, and actually it's quite a familiar rock if you do um, field work in northwestern Scotland, which I do a lot of. So um, it looks like home. It's lovely. So that's Skeletos. Shallow water, high energy. Next we have the Cruziana ichnophages, and this is best developed below the normal fair weather wave base, so a little bit deeper than Skeletos. We associate this with well sorted silts and sands, and those are generally accumulating within a low energy environment. The Cruziana ichnophages includes a number of um, ichnogenera, again listed here. Um, I wanted to highlight two things. Uh, first, that um, it's named after Cruziana, and Cruziana is what's shown here. This is the kind of um, of trail that we, um, in the Paleozoic, associ <coughs> sorry, associate with the trilobites, for example, trilobite moving traces, or crawling traces. Um, and I wanted to highlight that, um, A, that's, I guess, not just trilobites, um, but also that there are a number of different um, trace fossils associated with this particular ichnophages, one of which is called chondrites. Um, bear in mind that we will, and I'll highlight this now, that that is completely separate to chondrite or chondrites, which are chondritic meteorites. So this is a genus called chondrites, which is confusingly exactly the same and spelt exactly the same as a very large group of meteorites. Bear that in mind if you, in case that gets confusing to you at any point. As, as I highlighted, this is normally associated with um, rocks deposited below, below the normal fair weather wave base, but it can also be developed in estuarine, lagoonal and shelf environments where there are relatively quiet conditions. So bear in mind this isn't a smoking gun indicator of a particular depth. You have to have a, a nuanced understanding of the depositional environment to help you understand what it actually means. All of these different genera that you can see here are crawling traces, but there are some examples which are inclined burrows. And this represents the activities of both suspension and detritus feature, feature, uh, feeders, which are sometimes joined by mobile carnivores. So that is the Cruziana ignophages. Let's go on to Zuvikos. Zuvikos, why can't I say that word today? <coughs> Zuvikos. This ignophages represents quiet water presumably with adequate nutrient conditions. So we're typically talking about deep shelf to upper continental slope, deep water settings, um, but we sometimes see this in shallower or deeper water environments with similar environmental conditions. So for example, lagoons. So again, it's not a smoking gun, but it is useful. Um, the Sufikos ignophages includes uh, a number of genera of which I've put an example of Sufikos itself on the right hand side here. So this is this kind of like fan shaped um, burrow that you can see in these rocks here. And it's a facies that's dominated by complex but efficient feeding and grazing trails of deposit feeders. And it's relatively common throughout the Jurassic, Cretaceous and the tertiary of Europe. So there is a time element to this as well. My final um, depth related ignophages is the Nereites ignophages and this is associated with quiet but moderately well oxygenated seabeds. Hence, we're normally looking at our deepest settings in which we have enough oxygen to um, support life. So um, we're talking um, 
all the way up to abyssal depths as long as there is enough oxygen. And this comprises a diverse crawling and grazing trail collection. You also get networks which may have trapped or farmed foods. So there's an example of this on the right in, in terms of this um, genus called Paleodictian, which is really cool and quite, um, I think, well known as a trace fossil. It's very, very pretty. Um, but at least the last time I did any reading about this, we didn't have a clear idea of what the trace makers for this were. I will probably look it up after finishing recording this video, and if the uh, trace makers are now known, I will happily put it on the website and be like, oh, Pastor Russell didn't know what he was talking about. Um, so these trails and networks tend to be mutually exclusive, so um, the environment can only support one of those two types of trace fossils. So those are our depth associations. I wanted to finish by highlighting, though, that this general trend has been criticised in detail in some publications, and that's because the behaviour recorded by trace fossils is also influenced by a range of things other than depth. So, for example, we know that behaviour can be influenced by the turbulence of water, by the sedimentation rate of a particular area, and by the availability of food. And as such, I guess I should leave you with a take-home message, and that's that I believe these facies, ichnofacies, and indeed the benthic assemblages and the biofacies that I've already introduced, are probably useful. They're broadly correlated with depth, but they are not invariably so. And in the case of ichnofacies, they can occur far outside their normal environments if the conditions are right. This means that we have to have a nuanced view of them and we have to take all of the evidence that is available to us, including the sedimentological as well as the, the traces of life and the fossils themselves when we're trying to understand a depositional environment. And if that is a depositional environment of a known area with a known set of formations, actually quite a lot of reading can be useful to help us really tie down these associations. And this is the basis of the images that you can see here. And so this example, for example, is showing the change in the uh, trace fossils and species richness that we get as we're going from aerobic through to anaerobic conditions. And I've put some more example of chondrites here on the right. And that's because ichnofacies can be used to identify some environments um, which we um, associate with depth but under different environmental conditions. So for example, this series of, um, of images shows chondrites, which are associated as well as with depth with oxygen starvation. So chondrites is commonly associated with dysaerobic facies. So bear that in mind. And all of that plays into our idea of assemblages. So I hope that's useful. Um, I hope that, that that kind of gives you an overview of how these things work without being overly uh, detailed, because we don't have time to be so, um, but without leaving too many questions unanswered for you. If you do have questions, obviously ask them on the discussion forum or on the Zoom as per usual. And I just wanted to finish by saying thank you for watching the videos. Thank you for engaging with all of the exercises. Thank you for turning up to the Zoom synchronous sessions. I have really appreciated the opportunities I've had to interact with you over the course of the four weeks on macro fossils that have made up this course. I do hope you have found them useful and interesting and would naturally welcome any feedback on them that you do have. But in the meantime, if you have any questions about macro fossils now or throughout the rest of your time with us at Manchester, or in fact, at any other point once you've graduated, do please feel free to get in touch at any point and I will happily try and answer them. And that brings me to the end of my final video for 27201. Thank you for your time and attention and I will see you in our synchronous Zoom session. Well, in fact, we've had a lot of synchronous Zoom session, so I'll probably see you around the department once COVID is over, which I hope happens sometime in the near future. So thank you very much and see you soon.